so it looks like it's one o'clock. I guess I will begin. Um, first off, with this title slide, I want to just make a point. This um, is going to dwell a bit on the immune system and how it works. And I think I thought about this a bit. This is a daunting topic because it's so huge, but you hear a lot on the news about vaccines, and um, I'm going to try to not repeat things you can hear or read in the newspaper um, and try to give you a little more basis for understanding what's going on. Uh, it's going to be a sketch. It's not going to be um, uh, a semester course or a year or you could make a career out of this. In fact, it would be a lovely career, wonderful career for anyone. Uh, I'll give some examples of that, but the beginning picture here, it shows a CD4 activated T cell. That would be a helper cell. And um, it's hooked up with an uh, antigen presenting cell. Up oh. and my point in this slide showing that there are all these fancy molecules attached on the surface. That's largely how cells talk to each other when they're in proximity. They hook up their uh, devices, sort of like putting their hands together. So uh, they're like docking posts, these molecules on the cell surface. I thought that would be a good mental model to keep in mind for almost everything that happens. There are also uh, humoral, uh, not humorous, but humoral, meaning uh, molecules that float in the serum and float from one uh, cell to another. That's another way they talk to each other. Okay, this is a slide from my last presentation on this, which was on the 4th of February in 2020, I believe. I regretted one thing. I wasn't even going to mention this, but I regretted that I mentioned this is uh, in the, I, I titled that China, Chinese uh, Wuhan virus. And that was before people knew what to call it. It was brand new and hadn't hit hardly anywhere except in China. And then that became an ugly political thing to say. And so I regret the title, but it was before it was politicized and turned uh, xenophobic. So um, I think the um, if you want to blame someone for the emergence of this virus, blame humans for living in this world, because that's where this virus came from, and there's more. The Baltimore classification of viruses was a big advance from about 1970, and it depends on the mechanisms of reproduction, of, of infection and reproduction that viruses use, rather than morphology and um, antigens that can be detected with antibodies that are will luminesce or uh, that sort of thing. So it was... Uh, really uh, a development of the um, molecular uh, biology uh, discipline that um, started in the 50s, largely because of the explanation of how DNA works. We're in group uh, type four with coronavirus. It's a type four um, virus that has a single strand RNA, which is positive sense, meaning it acts just like one of your ordinary messenger RNAs. And another one we're going to be talking about a little bit is adenoviruses, which are used as viral vectors. And that's a type one um, virus uh, with double-stranded DNA, although the vaccines we'll discuss don't have the uh, original adenovirus DNA in them. They, uh, um, that's been replaced, but they're using the capsid, uh, uh, which is, can be synthesized or self-assembled from pieces um, that are uh, 
uh, viral-like particles, as they're called, uh, that um, can um, act like a submarine to get the uh, torpedo to its target. Okay, uh, well, this is well known, really. COVID uh, viral particles, they're enveloped, which is one of the problems uh, because of the envelope, there's a few of the uh, uh, structural proteins uh, visible. Uh, basically, you have the spike protein that sticks out uh, and is accessible to the immune system. And that's one reason why it's being targeted as the, um, uh, uh, or used as the target of virus um, uh, vaccines. Um, they're roughly spherical, about 90 nanometers. And uh, um, as I said, with type, as with any type four uh, virus, it's a single strand positive sense RNA uh, that's in this little uh, container that uh, has a complex hookup to target cells and releases its uh, cargo. Um, this codes also for 16 non-structural proteins and it's beautifully complex and more is understood about it than was uh, last February. Um, See, I guess I'll go in here. I just liked this picture. It's, um, I, I'm sure, artist's uh, conception, at least in part, um, but it shows a relative size of uh, uh, an expanded cell with uh, virons on the surface. Looks kind of moldy, like, uh, like an old muffin that, uh, <laughs> you probably shouldn't eat <laughs> like uh, uh, Synergy's uh, casserole. <laughs> anyway, this is from the National Institute of Allergy and In Infectious Diseases, and they are government-supported uh, institutes, so what they produce is public domain. And as I've said before, the National Institutes of Health for the United States is one of the great achievements of the United States government which with good leadership and um, use, uh, proper use of its talent can achieve great things. Okay, steps in infection. This is really focusing on the early steps. First off, attachment. Everybody kind of knows about that, I think. One of the things that um, we knew before was it was angiotensin II receptors, angiotensin uh, converting enzyme uh, um, receptors, um, which are common on endothelial cells of blood vessels, which are therefore common in the respiratory system because you have uh, the vascularity of the uh, interface for gas exchange is so um, uh, uh, abundant there. And that is... Um, a good place for a, an airborne infectious particle to attack. Uh, something that I wasn't aware of, I don't think was known generally last February, but heparin sulfate, which is on every mammalian cell, is uh, part of the res uh, um, attachment uh, uh, process. I'll talk about that in, in a minute. Once it attaches, it, it penetrates, it requires uh, 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 action of, by uh, uh, protease, which means it breaks up protein, uh, uh, this transmembrane protease, serine S1, membro 2. And, um, uh, and when it get off on that too much because it'll take time, uh, there are also proteases that are uh, in the cell and some in the Golgi process even that are uh, play, uh, that play a role in this. Um, Golgi process is really a pretty important in this. I just wanted to show you what heparin sulfate looks like. Um, it's... Um, 
Uh, I, I made a, a note to myself about it, so if I can find my note. Uh, linear polysaccharide. Um, these are repeating units, and they're very similar. The uh, lower one here is uh, the um, uh, um, medical heparin that can be synthesized. And um, uh, heparin um, often occurs, heparin sulfate anyway, it's in all mammalian cells and on cell surfaces and that tends to occur in uh, adjacent strands attached to cell membranes or to proteins in the extracellular matrix. So it's kind of an interesting player in this. Interestingly, too, uh, other viruses like respiratory syncytial virus uses heparin sulfate as a receptor to get in the cells. So you've got that. And one of the points I'm going to make, I'm just say it right now is in this, is that uh, this whole system is very geared. It's like you're being attacked by something that's been planning. Uh, it's, I may have misspelled it. Uh, uh, the, I can't tell, are you capitalizing or heparin sulfate is, is just this moiety of uh, molecule. It's a polysaccharide uh, type um, uh, molecule. The heparin uh, product would probably be capitalized. Anyway, um, N, N is quite variable. Uh, I, I, uh, I would have to look that up to be able to answer that uh, with better precision. I'm sure somebody gives a range on it. But they, these are pretty good sized molecules. Um, sort of like any polysaccharide. Um, Let's see. The, uh, these next few slides just uh, relate to um, the use of uh, uh, heparin sulfate in uh, by the virus to get into the cell. Um, one point I was starting to say about this is that this virus, it's like an enemy that's been planning its attack and has you all figured out. In this case, just nature is so diverse, and this happens to um, have done its beta testing on similar organisms and managed to jump to our species. But um, uh, any cure or control of this kind of virus is going to require very specific um, strategies of attack. Um, drinking herbal tea isn't going to do it. And the eye of a newt uh, mixed with uh, uh, the breath of a virgin or something like this isn't going to cut it. Uh, it's going to require uh, uh, really careful s strategic science. So at any rate, uh, the um, uh, uh, ACE inhibitor, uh, ACE2 inhibitor, uh, I'm sorry, ACE2 uh, receptor and the heparin sulfate uh, together um, uh, cause a shift in the uh, uh, spike protein and it gets cleaved uh, by protease into two pieces, which is part of its, uh, and there's an area on it called the receptor binding domain, which gets shifted so that the, uh, uh, without the heparin sulfate, it can't get into the cell, which has um, been looked at a bit. Uh, uh, yeah, I know, I was, I was kind of trying to make up something, Synergy. <laughs> it, uh, eye of the newt and the breath of a virgin isn't particularly uh, scientific, but I was um, doing a Monty Python mockery of uh, medieval science. Um, 
anyway, uh, both these molecules are necessary and they, uh, uh, Neuropolin is another molecule that's really very interesting. Uh, and I had a note here about it. I, it just uh, It's involved in uh, embryogenesis, uh, uh, guides axons. It's involved in angiogenesis. It's a very uh, common molecule in, in uh, mammals, but uh, it um, potentiates the uh, uh, attachment and uh, infection by the uh, uh, coronavirus. So um, uh, I wanted to bring it to mind uh, for you. These, uh, the S protein gets broken into two uh, polypeptides, S1 and S2, and there's changes in conformation that uh, affect how it binds. Uh, as it gets taken up. So this is just another cell for information, uh, another uh, slide for information sake. Um, there is one point I want to make from this slide. Uh, well, two actually. One is this uh, neuropolin is really abundant, not just in the respiratory system, but also olfactory epithelium. And that may just have something to do with the way people lose their sense of smell at the beginning of these infections. And one of the long-term effects, a few people never get their sense of smell back so far. And um, some have dysosmia where things just don't smell right or they don't smell pleasant. Um, that's uh, does some permanent damage to olfactory epithelium, probably. Um, anyway, uh, the other point I wanted to make is that um, you have these uh, uh, various... Um, oh, it's not on this slide. Maybe it was on the previous slide. I guess it was on the previous slide. You have these various... Uh, uh, proteases that are involved. Some are viral derived and some are host um, dependent. Um, and this slide, um, I'm not going to dwell on those, but this slide has uh, the peptidase, meaning they, they break, the, they, they cleave peptides. Um, uh, and um, um, it indicates in under origin, whether it's viral or host derived, and uh, under function where it acts. And you see the ones that are acting on the uh, spike protein in particular. Um, so this is just a reference slide, and it's on that uh, PDF that I shared. And if anyone's just come in, if you ask one of the others, uh, if you could, uh, uh, Chantal, I'm sure, would share the note card with you that uh, I uh, um, put out at the beginning of this. Um, here is something I, I talked about a bit in February, and it was more generic. There are 16 non-structural uh, uh, polypeptides and four structural ones. Um, this one single about 30,000 bases. Um, it's a single strand messenger RNA type molecule that's in the virus. It acts like, it pretends to be a messenger RNA. As soon as it gets into the cytosol, cytoplasm it, of the cell, it can uh, start to use its uh, equipment to make proteins. Just like somebody that happens to get in your door and the first thing some of these people do is go to your fridge and look for your beer. So, um, uh, um, thank you for um, attention to that, Chantal, about the PDF. Um, so this protein, this uh, M this RNA strand has this strange uh, thing, and I really. Um, I'm curious about how this 
has arisen in nature, but there's this frame shifting. When it gets red, it jumps. It has uh, uh, a, a jump and uh, across this uh, little bridge in a way, uh, uh, which is called a frame shift, and it ends up uh, with this long protein uh, or uh, peptide that has um, um, uh, its own enzymatic activity. Uh, uh, it's it's kind of a super a super peptide, I would say. Um, there are two peptidases in, that help mature, that are viral, that help mature the uh, viral peptide. Uh, one is from, I'm, I'm not going to give the names, I think they're indicated on here, but uh, one's from structural, uh, non-structural protein 3, and the other one's from non-structural protein 5. But while they're in situ and this thing folds up, those areas still act. And uh, the one on uh, non-structural protein 3 cuts the polypeptide at three different sites, and those are indicated and uh, by the black uh, uh, little triangles there. The um, MPRO uh, uh, peptidase uh, on non-structural protein 5 cuts at 11 sites. And so you end up with 16 um, peptide chains. And um, these have um, uh, RNA polymerase activity. So one of the first things uh, uh, this thing does is um, replicate its own RNA strand to make a negative strand. And from that, it starts to do reverse um, transcription to make uh, um, uh, a number of other uh, shorter ones. but. Uh, uh, of, of RNA segments and, and um, eventually these uh, structural proteins are made. Um, this is kind of the big view. A lot of this takes place, uh, it gets down to the uh, endoplasmic reticulum and it uh, is felt to take place on uh, ribosomes attached, you know, mammalian ribosomes outside the mitochondria. The mitochondria have ribosomes of a somewhat different size, a little bit smaller, maybe a little bit reflective of bacterial origin of mitochondria. But um, uh, the mitochondria that has a 30 and a 55 uh, S unit, but the uh, rough endoplasmic reticulum has these attached ribosomes. So they they act and play uh, where they're attached, and the uh, one interesting point about the endoplasmic reticulum is that it has a lumen, has a lumen. Things go on inside of it, and it uh, the lumen has a little bit of a different environment from the rest of the cytosol, and it connects or things can be transported to the Golgi apparatus. That's shown as distinct here. Uh, in this diagram, Golgi apparatus is involved in packaging and um, creating vessels, and that's particularly active in secreting cells like parathyroid uh, or thyroid uh, endocrine cells. Um, but in this case, uh, it packages up the uh, um, final product of the virons that get released. So that's how the um, that's how the infection takes place. I don't want to dwell on it so much as then uh, to switch to how does a vaccine work. Uh, I want to go back and talk a, for a moment about the uh, reproduction number, um, or R naught is the initial reproduction number, but the reproduction number of the uh, virus can be changed. Uh, the example here, this is from a February 2020 uh, slide was uh, measles uh, was a horrific uh, genocidal virus for uh, Native Americans. And you look in that it got a, a population that is naive, immunologic, immunologically naive to 
a new antigen, um, then one person can infect 16 or 18 other people uh, easily. And um, if you look at the formula for um, basic reproduction number, you have this transmiss transmissibility, uh, the uh, uh, factor, these are all multiplicative factors, and proportionalities, average rate of contact between suscepted and infected individuals, and the duration of infectiousness, how long people were infected. Um, the transmissibility can be altered and any one have an idea how it can be altered? Transmissibility by can be altered by keeping away from people. It can be altered by wearing a mask. If everyone wears a mask, 85% of the infections are probably not going to happen. That's the number that's usually bantied about. Uh, it's, in other words, transmissibility is, is really dependent on a lot of conditions. Um, and the rate of contact, you can, you can vary that. You can keep infected people away from inf uninfected people or susceptible people. Uh, social isolation. There's a lot we can do that we're not doing. And basically, uh, you have a society that's torn apart by um, politics and stupidity and have an enemy. It's come and you could have fought it at, uh, on the ocean or before it got there. Or you can fight it in your coastal towns or you can fight it in Chicago or um, uh, um, uh, Metz or uh, Stuttgart or, uh, you know, uh, uh, Milan or, where, you know, once it gets well inland, uh, if you just ignore it and say it'll just disappear because it ain't going to do that. It ain't going to do what you want to do or want it to do. And uh, you've got to, you know, play ball with reality. So, I like the word Argo. I like words. And so I made this slide, um, and this is sort of a reference slide uh, that you can go back and look at uh, in the PDF as well, if you like. There is so much lingo or uh, jargon or inside knowledge, uh, inside uh, language uh, in immunology that you can start to look at it and think, what the hell? But um, if you take these words and kind of try to even just take this slide and just look them up one by one, if I'd been more, uh, uh, I probably would have done it if I'd had more time. I could have made the, uh, on my PDF so that each uh, of these entries was a uh, link to a definition, but I didn't do that, but you can do that for yourself. Um, a lot of terms you'll hear, viral vector, when you have uh, um, viruses as a little bit more traditional that are put into, um, as a vaccine, or that are put into a viral capsule, that's a viral vector. Uh, a lipid nanoparticle is what's being used with this new mRNA technology where uh, mRNA uh, that's related to the original infectious agents being used as your bullet to uh, uh, stimulate or to give the alert to uh, target cells. And um, uh, clonal uh, selection is a word that comes up in terms of when you get uh, T cells or B cells that are sitting around uh, uh, waiting for something to happen, and then they get the signal, something's up. They undergo clonal selection. There's all these steps and incredible control in that. 
efficacy versus effectiveness. Generally, effectiveness relates to real world, whereas efficacy is if you have a real controlled situation. You can do, uh, like in their um, uh, reports of efficacy of these um, vaccines, uh, they're talking about um, their group uh, of uh, the people that received the real deal versus the ones that received the uh, placebo uh, or the uh, non-vaccine. Uh, and uh, I'm kind of pausing. In one case, uh, in AstraZeneca, in the first shot, they gave a uh, um, uh, meningococcal meningitis vaccine because it often causes reactions so that people would think, man, they gave me something. I bet it was the real deal. So that people's perception of what was happening would not affect their uh, outcomes of their study. But uh, at any rate, um, studies talk about efficacy, but the effectiveness is sort of yet to be proven. That's how it's gonna work in the real world. In the United States, the effectiveness is about like everything else has been recently. Uh, not so hot, but there is hope. Adaptive immunity is the term for what keeps you alive, what keeps you from rotting from the moment you're exposed to the air. Um, you also have uh, innate immunity, and I have that in the lower right-hand corner. Antigen recognition, signal transduction, that's uh, basically cells uh, um, get turned on by um, encounter and they send out their signals in various ways, especially cytokines and such. Um, and this human leukocyte antigen, HOA system is really uh, important. I wanna just talk about that for a second uh, and then I'll, we're gonna go on. Um, there, that's, that's a, a system of genes. And if you do transplantation or um, um, uh, cancer stem cell therapy, uh, uh, you've got to do matching of HLA uh, genes or else you'll get rejection of the, uh, of the uh, cells that are, um, whether it's transplant or stem cells that are introduced. Uh, these, um, MHC are major histocompatibility genes or molecules. Uh, I hear the terms used almost identically. Uh, I like to specify if I'm talking about the genes or the molecules. All those genes are on the short arm of chromosome six. These are not the same as blood type. You know, people say I'm type A and all that. Uh, that's um, for blood typing for like blood banks. That's basically uh, chromosome nine stuff. So that's a whole different thing. But uh, at any rate, um, there's really three classes of MHC molecules. There's over 200 of uh, genes associated with these. And um, uh, uh, I, I'll just, I just have them listed there. I won't read them. The, uh, uh, they are very important to professional antigen presenting cells, which I'm going to tell you about. So I'm saying all these things because I'm going to, you're going to hear it again in some of the description. Uh, and of particular importance is plasma cell uh, uh, leading to uh, vector cells that uh, vector plasma cells that produce antibodies or memory cells. And you can have the same with T cells, thymus, process, they're all um, uh, basically uh, blood cells that uh, generated by uh, stem cells in the uh, bone marrow, but the uh, T cells get processed by the thymus uh, early on. And <laughs> somebody's telling me to move on. <laughs> so anyway, um, also, cytokines are extremely important. They're soluble, hormonal-like, short distance, for the most part, molecules that uh, are part of the communication system for cells. Um, interleukins are an example of that, and that's, there are 
um, how interferons, interleukins, chemo, um, chemokines, mesenchymal growth factors, tumor necrosis factor, adipokines, over 100 genes coding for different cytokines. They're very important. You hear about cytokine storm. Well, it's a big subject. <laughs> a big important thing here I want to uh, put in your head, CD4, T helper cell, CD4 versus CD8. Um, the uh, uh, These are the actors in the system. The antigen presenting cells include in the, um, uh, uh, the middle top row macrophage, uh, the left middle row B cells and dendritic cells. Uh, the dendritic cells, back when I, I think I, I talked about the uh, liver and uh, um, hepatosteatohepatitis, uh, non, non-alcoholic uh, steatohepatitis, uh, fatty liver disease from, uh, which was sort of a metabolic disorder, not from alcoholism or infection, but you have these uh, in, uh, dendritic cells that were initially discovered by Langerhans. He thought they were nerve cells. Um, and, um, those take up um, antigens and uh, process them and then post them on uh, um, uh, specific uh, types of uh, molecules on their surface. I did, uh, uh, I threw this slide in because I'm, I'm going to talk about vaccines in a couple minutes, and it just lists, uh, it's another sort of reference slide in the lower left-hand corner, it lists uh, various uh, strategies for vaccines, an activated vaccine, which is what I think uh, is being tried in India, um, live attenuated vaccine, which I think is what's uh, going on in China, um, and, um, uh, replicating viral vaccination, uh, vectored vaccine, which is uh, like our mRNA technology and non-replicating viral vector vaccine. Well, that, that means it gets a little confusing because like the Russians are using a, a, ad, a human adenovirus uh, type 5 and 26, which is non-replicating, but they're putting... Uh, uh, reverse engineered DNA that will produce um, mRNA that will produce spike protein components that will then get uh, chewed up inside the cell and put through the lumen of um, uh, goes through the tap pore or the tap conduit uh, which is a, a, a large protein uh, that controls what gets into the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum and gets processed there and posted on MH1 or MH2, uh, um, uh, major histocompatibility molecules, um, um, MHC1 and MHC2, uh, and pieces of antigen get posted on those, and if they happen to come from you, when your T cells come up, they say, okay, we know this guy, he's all right. And if they're uh, strangers, then your T cell says, I want you to step over here and keep your hands up. Um, so anyway, there's a lot of strategies that have been used. This mRNA technology is the new thing. Most people think of this in terms of what the goal is, uh, producing antibodies. But it's really more complex than this. There's five different types of antibodies um, that mostly in terms of uh, dealing with uh, uh, vaccination, you're 
you're talking initially uh, you produce IgM antibodies, which are sort of like this. They have um, two long chains and two short chains, um, or light, heavy and light chains that are Y-shaped. Uh, if you took about, I don't know, five or six of these, put them on a pinwheel, like a martial arts weapon, uh, then you'll have an M antibody, uh, um, M immunoglobulin. Now, the uh, because uh, the antigen binding sites on such a, um, a pinwheel type uh, antibody would be so multiple, you get agglutination, which helps in early infection, so that antigens get clumped and phagocyte. Uh, 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 Macrophages can come up and eat them and process them and put some of their um, um, antigen-derived protein on their uh, MH2 cells and uh, uh, wake up the um, uh, T cells and uh, get them stimulated and they uh, go through some changes I'm going to tell you about in a second. So. At any rate, IgM and IgG. IgG is the more permanent or longer lasting or the secondary wave of antibodies that are pr produced in systemic infections or serious infections. Um, uh, I, don't, I don't want to get into the other ones um, here because I won't get done. I couldn't find a slide I really liked that uh, showed a couple points. So I, I drew my own. I forgot here. Uh, you have two cells here, a B cell, and did I speak poorly? Uh, thank you. Uh, I may have gotten twisted in my sentence. Uh, I'm not sure. Anyway, um, the B cell is on the left, and here's a T cell on the right, and this T cell has a T cell receptor that's specific for this um, um, B cell. And um, the B cell has uh, antibodies on its surface. And if an antigen comes up that uh, attaches to it, it will take it inside. I've got another slide that shows that, but I tried to indicate here was sort of getting scooped in or sucked in, and it gets processed in a vacuole uh, with proteases and ends up uh, going through the TAP um, transporter that controls what gets into the endoplasmic reticulum and gets processed in there. And pieces of that antigen end up getting put out onto the MH2 molecule. These, uh, there's these MH, I'm, I'm sorry, MHC2, class 2, I should say. There's two of these that are uh, important uh, in this, in, in terms of cell biology. Uh, MHC class 3 in, includes soluble components like complement system and that sort of thing, but uh, um, Again, these are all from the chromosome six short arm. Uh, the um, uh, B cell is uh, a good example, I hit it there, of one of the three, the dendritic and the macrophages and the B cells are the antigen presenting um, um, uh, cells in the immune system. That's a really important concept. And they all have these MHC uh, class two molecules. Uh, they will hook up with C, uh, with um, T helper cells that are specific. These these are brothers by a different mother, so to speak. Uh, this T helper cell is specific for this B cell, and they stimulate each other and um, there's one other thing, it has to be a CD4 molecule has to be on this. Um, the, um, let's see.
kind of forgetting. I, I made some notes to myself. To, I wanted to. So I, well, anyway, as CD4 is a cluster differentiation for uh, the two to remember, cluster of differentiation is a good translation for CD4. If you just remember CD, that's fine. I, I'm going to tell you about what CD4 does. Uh, the uh, CD4 molecule is required for the T helper cell to get turned on. If um, it um, interacts with this antigen um, um, major histocompatibility molecule 2, MHC2, uh, that's on the B cell, then it will get stimulated. It will release cytokines into the environment, which among other things, it, it'll, it'll tell other cells in the environment that this, this uh, we got something going on here. Um, and um, uh, I've got a cat that's sitting on my notes now, so I'm on my own. Uh, this um, cytokines will interact with the B cell, and it flips its switch. The B cell proliferates to form a clone, and uh, it differentiates and forms two kinds of cells, mostly effector plasma cells, which um, effector cells are cells that are carrying out uh, defense mechanisms. Uh, the effector plasma cells uh, uh, are producing antibodies, and then there are some memory cells that uh, are um, there. They have longer half-lives and by quite a lot, and uh, they will reactivate when it, uh, this infection ever comes back, assuming you win and eliminate it. Here is a somatic cell. Every somatic cell except for your red blood cells, which has your red blood cells have no nucleus. Basically, it's usually said every nucleated cell has MHC, uh, MHC1 class MHC class one uh, molecules on them. In this case, I made um, an antigen that happened to get in there, um, some kind of invas invasive thing, like a little virus. That's, I, I made it as a red star. And then one of the arms of that star ended up on the MHC class one molecule. If a, T, a cytotoxic T cell, that's a CD8, CD8 and CD4 are cofactors. They, these, these interactions are very controlled so the immune system doesn't go crazy. Um, but if the cytotoxic cell comes up and uh, sees that uh, there's this, uh, and it's a specific T cell, again, for this particular uh, um, molecule, um, and it sees there's this antigen and says, this guy doesn't belong here. Uh, and it has CD4, CD8 has to be there to interact with the MHC1 molecule, just like CD4 uh, uh, is an adjacent molecule to the um, um, uh, T cell receptor and the help, helper cells. It interacts with, you know, like down on the neck of the, uh, of the uh, MHC one, class one molecule. Then the T cytotoxic cell turns on, it releases cytokines and it can also release particles uh, uh, that have enzymes. One perforin will drill holes basically through the membrane of the somatic cell. And uh, then um, granzymes are like um, uh, toxic, will kill the cell. This is one way your body controls cancer. This is a, um, an effective way that for something like cancer, your um, uh, uh, cytotoxic T cells are needed. Now I had one thing, I, I was um, 
confused at one time about um, AIDS and why people with AIDS were getting um, this Carposi sarco sarcoma. Uh, Carposi sarcoma is a, is, it presents on the skin and it's um, pretty rare, uh, but it's actually not due to this CD8 system, it's due to the CD4. The uh, AIDS kills the CD4 helper cells, which is probably the most important single cell in your immune system. And there is um, a type of herpes called herpes type eight. There are nine types of herpes simplex virus and, that infect humans uh, that I know of. And uh, type eight is um, normally not, um, uh, it doesn't cause severe disease, but uh, if the T helper cells are, are down, then it uh, builds up and proliferates and causes um, immunogenic effects and you get this uh, Carposi sarcoma. So uh, in that case, it's, uh, it's a sarcoma that's arising or a malignancy arising from a defect in the uh, um, T4, uh, CD4 um, T helper cells. So at any rate, B cells and T helper cells have to be brothers. They have to be kind of related and recognize the same epitope or active uh, little area of domain of a um, of a um, polymer of amino acids or a peptide or um, um, uh, an antigen. Um, and over on the right, I showed um, this because I thought it showed a nice way of um, how the uh, B cell. Uh, how the um, the antibody picks up an antigen, gets engulfed, processed, and then pieces of the antigen present on the, this would be a B cell, I guess, so that's, that would be a, uh, um, um, a um, an MHC2 molecule, and then a T helper cell, which has a CD4 mo uh, molecule, will interact with the uh, B cell and say, yeah, this doesn't belong here, we need to gear you up and wipe this thing out before it wipes us out. So that B cell undergoes proliferation, differentiation, and produces uh, effector cells that make lots of antibodies. That's what you want a vaccine to do. Okay, clinical testing. I'll just say quickly, number one thing, safety. Number two, efficacy. Uh, and we had some discussion in Science Friday about this yesterday uh, that um, you know, it, it, it'd be uh, uh, unconscionable to uh, give a vaccine to millions of people that would make a lot of otherwise healthy people sick. The vaccine has to be tolerable. Uh, you want it to do what it does without causing any extra effects as much as possible. Um, so, uh, you do preclinical studying with m m mice, with animals, you test for tolerance, toxicity, get some idea about uh, how much uh, the drug might be tolerable per mass, body mass. And uh, if antibodies are formed, that sort of thing, then you do phase one. These are all done as separate studies. Um, these are not combined or pooled numbers. And then you do phase one studies, and that's usually uh, I took this from, uh, I guess, the FDA, but uh, most of the time when I hear people talk about it, they say 100 patients or so. Uh, you want healthy people there. You don't want to, you want to see what's going on without having comorbidities confuse or muddy the water. Um, uh, phase two, you, you, it's, a, it's a bigger study yet, but you also want... Uh, maybe 100 to 1,000 people, and you have determination of dosage uh, in phase one and two. You fine tune it in phase two, and then find, uh, phase three is uh, thousands of people. And um, one of the problems is a lot of countries are uh, bypassing phase three 
or not doing uh, convincing phase three studies with sufficient follow up. And so um, that has hurt their credibility in terms of the vaccines they're producing. Um, this is a wonderful story, and I give the reference here. It's, uh, and I'm not going to tell the story, but this is a lady came from Hungary, Kareko, uh, from Hungary uh, around 1985, and uh, she was at first at Temple University in uh, Philadelphia, and then came over to University of Pennsylvania. And uh, I did not know her. I, I was at P University of Pennsylvania at that time. Um, but it's a big place with lots of thousands of people, thousands of people doing research. Um, so she was sidelined and sort of dismissed, but she was interested in mRNA technology and the other forms of immunization were so well established that people didn't want to fund her. And she connected with Drew Weissman at Penn uh, and uh, eventually, uh, by staying with it, got somewhere with it. She's vice president of, uh, uh, I guess, bio, BioNTech, uh, which uh, I guess works with Pfizer. Um, nanocarriers, I'll just say, this is a reference slide, that nanocarrier is a, a lipid biparticle that contains a virus. And that's what the um, mRNA technology is using. Um, it takes the uh, uh, um, RNA for the spike protein and takes pieces of that. And so it has antigens that can be presented to cells. And it's given as a, um, um, as a shot in the arm and the deltoid muscle. And um, We'll get into some somatic cells. The little lipid nanoparticle will merge with the cell membrane, or it may encounter some antigen processing cells. And with the second shot, there are probably going to be more antigen processing cells in that area drawn in by whatever immune inflammatory response is generated initially. But this has an international non-proprietary name um, uh, as listed, uh, usually almost unpronounceable, uh, but it was the first uh, to get authorized for emergency use. Uh, that is a good question. Um, the um, fact is, uh, Shiloh asks, uh, which vaccine producer is best? Uh, I think they're both quite good. They both have similar efficacy, as I'm going to talk about. But the truth of it is that right now, if you've got a shot at getting a vaccine, you get what you get. And that's especially true for other countries, um, because there's there's not much, there's no choice unless I guess you're in the White House or something. I guess you can get whatever you want, but. Uh, um, the Pfizer trial says 40,000 plus participants, 95% effectiveness. In other words, uh, if you had uh, a, a, con a control group, unvaccinated group that had 100 uh, uh, people get sick with COVID, theoretically, um, um, only five of them would have gotten, gotten sick if they had had the vaccine. That's what the 95% means. It's two in, uh, shots, intramuscular, 21 days apart, ages 16 and up. This does have a fair response. But both Moderna, which does uh, mRNA technology, and Pfizer have a fairly big response, and they're recommending to people that work in the uh, doing surgery or working in the emergency room or whatever, if they get the shot, they need a few days to get past flu-like symptoms, and there's a fairly high number of um, those kind of achiness and malaise and some nausea, and uh, they've not had any uh, terrible responses to it. Uh, in the um, development of the Moderna vaccine, they had questions with uh, 
uh, transverse myelitis, or that's where, yeah, it's a, like you got inflammation uh, across the spine, uh, the, the spinal cord, um, which is really scary. But I don't think those were felt to be related. Uh, the Pfizer is for 16 years old and up. And I just threw these in for fun. This was the first lady to get this um, vaccine a UK grandmother, the uh, first one in, in the UK anyway. I think she was the first one ever uh, to get it as a patient. She was 91 years old, she said it was an early birthday present. And uh, Pfizer is really gearing up quickly to produce more of these. And here's William Shakespeare. He was number two to get jabbed uh, in the UK. And um, so I couldn't resist. I threw in this slide to vaccinate or not to vaccinate. There is no question. Um, all right. Moderna is very similar to the um, Pfizer, except the Pfizer needs to be like 70 degrees centigrade below uh, um, zero, negative 70 degrees zero uh, to um, um, uh, not um, to be degraded. And uh, the Moderna uh, has much milder requirements and can be stored in a, a, a freezer uh, or refrigerator for uh, and uh, 30 days and has to be used within 30 days. The Pfizer has vials, the multiple dose vials, they have to be used within um, five days. Um, the uh, main allergic uh, uh, concern about allergy with these is um, this PEG or polyethylene glycol or it's not like polysorbate uh, like molecule uh, which um, is felt might cause anaphylaxis. There were a few patients uh, that had anaphylaxis with these injections. Uh, so cold, stain, cold chain storage means it has to stay cold or it, it ruins, it gets, it can't be refrozen. It, and if it gets warm, uh, it will disintegrate very quickly and have no effectiveness. So this gives a review of the um, conditions for uh, Moderna and Pfizer, which are quite similar. I'm pretty close to finished. Um, Moderna and Pfizer are kicking up. Moderna's uh, trials, they had a weird thing, and I think they gave like 40,000 people in Brazil full dose, and then uh, um, a month later, full dose. Pfizer's 21 days separate for the two doses. Uh, in the UK, they screwed up somehow and gave a half dose on the first injection. Uh, and in the UK, they had about 95% effectiveness. Uh, in Brazil, it was uh, in the 50s. And so the average uh, uh, for uh, Moderna was 70%. Uh, it's not clear what went on there, and that's being studied further. Um, but even 70%, any vaccine that has more than 50%, uh, it's kind of the cutoff, is considered uh, to be um, uh, a decent choice. Now, AstraZeneca is a DNA, um, a double-stranded DNA that's in a uh, simian or a chim chimpanzee adenovirus as a viral vector. Um, and it codes for the S protein DNA. So it gets into the um, um, cell, um, and you would think it might get to the uh, antigen-presenting cells more effectively, uh, 
But at any rate, it gets into the cell and goes through the same processes of getting chopped up and pieces of the antigen get put on those um, inflammatory docking stations, uh, the MHC1 uh, class one molecule and MHC class two molecules. Um, now, Russia, I'm not going to get into too much. Russia has uh, Sputnik, which is also based on um, more traditional therapy. It is interesting. They kind of um, short-skirted uh, phase three. And so nobody's, the WHO and Europe and uh, nobody anywhere else has signed off on this as being uh, a, a vaccine of choice. But this disease has rendered a lot of governments absolutely desperate. And um, the uh, I took this article and just quoted it. Uh, it's from um, in our, uh, NPR, um, National Public Radio. Uh, the thing that I wanted to point out, uh, and I put it in highlight, the concern is they had not seen raw data from Sputnik trials. Basically, they're dealing off of... Uh, of uh, news reports, which you know how that is. Uh, but it's this kind of vaccine, it's more traditional, it's easy and inexpensive to produce, and it doesn't require super cold temperatures, so there's no cold chain. So they've got a workhorse of a vaccine. Now in terms of cost, Moderna is not going to make a profit on this until the um, pandemic's over. So their vaccine's about $4 a shot. Uh, the Pfizer's, I've seen 20 to $30 per shot. I don't know what the Sputnik would be, but it would be pretty cheap. But um, uh, the uh, Brazil's also using the Chinese virus, uh, Chinese vaccine, but recent um, data has indicated that its effectiveness is about 50.4%. So, um, uh, this is another sort of summary slide. It shows what a complex system we're dealing with. And my last comment on this, this is going to require real specific uh, remedies and procedures and approaches to fix this problem. It's also going to require the world to grow up and become more cooperative and share information and, um, you know, maybe um, respect nature, stop eating anything that has fur on it, uh, and um, uh, there, it's a tragic thing, I think, that the uh, lack uh, uh, the alacrity is cheerful promptness, but there's been absolutely no alacrity in the um, uh, dealing with um, uh, this pandemic, and it's allowed it to disseminate around the world. And the more it goes, the more chance it has to uh, mutate. It had um, an, an S and an L uh, form in uh, variants in China. And then in uh, Italy, another variant emerged um, sometime over the summer, and then more recently, South Africa and particularly the UK have had variants that have more infectiveness. In fact, the increased infectiveness can be anything from a difference in the way the uh, conformation of the S uh, spike protein is to uh, possibly more infectious particles being coughed out because of something in the uh, pathophysiology being a little different. But in any case, we're only a few mutations away from something that could wipe out 95% of the population, in my opinion. I don't want to scare you, but people need to stop screwing around. And um, the more time you give it, the more time this thing has to spread everywhere. And imagine if these were enemy troops. They're now in every town, controlling every highway, controlling the restaurants, everything. Um, should have been stopped before they got into the border.
But uh, that sounds xenophobic or something. But I mean, this is, is a model for what we're dealing with here because you can't see it. You've got people idiotically denying it. It requires intelligent, moderate, uh, civilized governance, people that uh, leadership that is proactive and visionary and not just lying. So that completes everything I think I can say right here. Uh, I can talk more about details next week. Any questions? Although sometimes the host probably feels like, just kill me. Uh, it's horrific what this does to people. And the, I don't think we're winning yet. That's, that's I'm glad you asked to, uh, brought that up. I meant to say that, are we winning yet? Sorry, no. And that's on us. We're going to have to do better. Interestingly, Ebola, the vaccine for Ebola required uh, um, uh, a cold chain. And we did pretty well with it. And it seemed a lot more scary than this because it caused this hemorrhagic uh, disease that just knocked people off overnight, practically. And I hope I didn't confuse people too much with, I wanted to show you the breadth and depth of uh, the uh, immunology, which this is all dependent on, the immunology and molecular biology. I took you in about up to your ankles. <laughs> What's your nose doing down by your ankles there, Synergy? <laughs> I probably missed lots of questions. I'm kind of get rolling. Um, yeah, that's uh, the Cleveland Browns are one of the things that... Uh, We've uh, lost. We've lost so many people. There, are, it's a dark, sad time. People dying alone. No goodbyes. It's hard to understand how people in leadership positions could allow themselves to. Let this go. That's a good question, Phil. I think that because of it's a zoonosis, there, there's even a recent report of a family of gorillas in San Diego who are infected with COVID. They've been coughing. And it's going to be in all these animals. It's in cats, some dogs. Um, it's... You know, humans are uh, not that special. They're, uh, I hope the uh, gorilla family survive it. Uh, they're so similar to us genetically that they could be in danger. Um, but um, it, it's, it's probably going to be around forever. We need to have cooperation on a global scale so that uh, it's like a global immunological task force that we can have um, heads up of potential viral infections and ways of dealing with them before they wipe us out. I was impressed that on, uh, I heard a man with the Irish Brogue yesterday on um, uh, Science Friday uh, mention 
he looks forward to the day when uh, the uh, vaccines and um, health um, uh, uh, responses are up and running before the pandemic hits. We're supposedly smart enough to do that, but humans have a way of sabotaging themselves so well. Dr. Mike Ryan, I'm not sure. I don't know. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Synergy. Vitamin D is fine. Don't take it till you're toxic, but it's probably a good idea. Helps prevent uh, prostate problems, for one thing. <laughs> I appreciate your attendance. This is uh, and my son's birthday was yesterday, and that he died four years ago. So I always feel down about this time of year. But imagine how torn up so many people are, and family members suddenly gone all around the world. This is a savage virus. Oh, that's really a good point, Baragon. mRNA does not change your DNA. It does not work in the nucleus. It doesn't go in the nucleus. It doesn't, it's not part of that uh, scene. Now the um, uh, viral vectors involving adenovirus, whether they're chimpanzee or uh, um, uh, human, like the type five and type 26 the Russian virus has, those will be transported to the nuclear membrane, which is a double layer membrane and has nuclear pores, which are, have a protein uh, complex that controls what gets in and out. And that's where the adenovirus injects its DNA into the nucleus in most models. And um, so the DNA does get in the nucleus because it needs to be, um, uh, uh, um, transcribed um, but um, uh, and that's where that takes place uh, um, and uh, then mRNA is produced and it comes out into the uh, cytosol where the, R where the ribosomes are and uh, gets translated uh, but um, even with that, the DNA is not expected to have any impact on your genome. Let's see, would have a, a vaccine be somewhat effective? Um, I think if we had antivirals, uh, I'm not sure if this answers your question. Uh, uh, oh, half dose. If, this is a good question, um, if the um, uh, um, uh, vaccination program is not done wholeheartedly, it may allow, in my opinion, for escape of, um, by, uh, um, 
variants that can uh, sub uh, sub uh, survive it. Uh, now they say it's not a problem that uh, when these variants become an issue, they will be able to modify the vaccine. But take a look at uh, with all we know about industrial engineering and manufacturing, producing things and distributing them and how difficult it is to get this vaccine up and running and distributed and then have people take it. So um, it's, you know, you, 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 it's like you got one job, you know, you got to do it right. <laughs> you got one shot, you got one bullet in your gun and uh, uh, about five seconds to use it or you're dead. Uh, it, it, think of it in those kinds of scenarios. Uh, I don't think there's much room to screw around here. And um, I think that the people spreading disinformation and um, it's, it's, they're very harmful. I'll just say they're very harmful. Wonder how they sleep at night, but. Thank you, Synergy. Yeah, and the people relating it to, um, what is it, G5? What is the um, uh, cell phone thing? Um, uh, this new generation of uh, um, uh, 5G. <laughs> uh, my phone, my cell phone is dyslexic. Yeah, somehow the uh, injection is going to make it so that Bill Gates can track you. Yeah, I think Bill Gates doesn't have that much time in the day. Well, I can think of a lot of a lot of people I'd rather not have track me. I would I would settle for Bill Gates. I don't think <laughs> bring it on, Bill. <laughs> What's he going to do? Hit you with a you know a, um, a noodle or something? I don't know. The blue screen of death. Yes, he will. He'll steal your precious bodily fluids. <laughs> I know there. These are um, uh, 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 Siri. Uh, that's an interesting point that uh, people claiming, uh, expressing their fears so readily uh, this way, and um, that would make. Um, Maybe something plausible for a one hour made for TV movie or uh, a sci fi short story or something. But, um, you know, if you know much about medical physiology, to know how difficult it would be to cause sterility in a systematic way. Thank you, Day. I appreciate your attendance. Yes, that was a Dr. Strangelove reference, Phil. <laughs> so, but we're down to 24 minutes after. Uh, I probably should uh, wrap it up. Thank you all very much again. It was an honor to present to you. Oh, and next week we have uh, once again uh, a, a panel to discuss some of these issues further.